Okay, so I'll start with a very brief introduction about 95% um, for those who have not worked directly with us. So we were set up in the year 2004. My background is in advertising. And when we were set up, we, we came about because we wanted to help people launch a successful career in advertising. And in the advertising industry, you need to be creative on demand. You cannot sit and wait for inspiration to strike and hope that it will strike. But uh, it, is, it has to be turning on the creative tab on demand. So a lot of the programs that we create, design, are bringing up the... Yeah. So in, in advertising, um, in order to bring out someone's creative talent and to bring out their personal character, we design training programs that give skills built on the foundation of personal growth. So a lot of effort is actually spent building up people's character. And since then, we've been best known for our expertise in these few areas. Number one is shifting mindsets. Um, how do we activate people's internal drive to perform? So they are not motivated by something external, but they're motivated by something that's internal. This is a very common outcome in the graduates of our program. Uh, we develop leaders at all levels. A lot of our graduates are now either creative directors, strategic planners, um, heads of companies even. And some of them are here today. We unlock creativity. So creativity uh, requires both your left and your right brain. You know, the right brain is the center of emotions. It is the center of expression and abstract thinking. But people who are too strong in the right brain will come up with all sorts of random creative stuff that doesn't make sense to anyone. On the other side, the left brain is responsible for logical thinking, analysis, um, reasoning. So people who are very strong in their left brain would be very logical, but predictable. So in order to be creative, it's harnessing the creative power of the right brain, but using that to serve a very practical and logical purpose. So that's what we do. We help to develop people's both brains. And then finally, it's once we create the awareness of how to think positively and how to have that kind of initiative and drive, then to turn that into a habit rather than it is just a, a concept that is very nice to know, but then it is not applied. And I always like to refer to my good friend Morpheus. Um, those of you who have seen The Matrix, you'll know Morpheus always says that knowing the path is not the same as walking the path. So what we are known for are our graduates are people who are walking the path. Even many, many years after they have left 95%, they are still walking the path. So over the years, in the year 2010, we started working on culture. And these are some of the leaders who have built their culture by working with us. Um, how we switched to culture was very simple. Our graduates come out with those, those um, mindsets that you saw earlier in the earlier slide. And when they went back to the office, the, the leaders were very impressed. And then one day, the Dean Bramham, the Kwailo, the Kwailo on the slide, um, met up with me at lunch and said, uh, can I then change the mindset of everyone in the company? And I said, sure, why not? Um, if we can do it with one or two or 12 people, why not with 100 people? So that was our first uh, foray into this, this area called company culture. Because when you can get everyone's mindset to change, you're essentially changing the way people work, you're essentially changing the culture of the company. So we've been working on culture since uh, 2010. And just before COVID-19 hit us, we're very happy to see that more and more companies are starting to understand that culture can be a huge differentiator when it comes to building a business, because culture determines whether your people drive and push and innovate, or are they just followers waiting to be led? A sign that was very heartening for us was when um, we started winning awards for the work that we've done. And in this particular award show, the Human Resources Magazine's annual event, the judges are some of the top HR people in the industry. So to have them judge the work that we've done and give us awards for it 
tells us that um, people are recognizing, companies are recognizing how important it is to work on company culture. For us, why company culture is so important is that our vision is to turn workplaces into joy places. And that's important to me personally because I know that we all have 24 hours in a day. Um, theoretically, that 24 hours is divided into three components. Eight hours for sleeping, theoretically, yeah, theoretically. Eight hours for sleeping, eight hours for working, and the other eight hours for the rest of life. So theoretically, we're supposed to have uh, one third of our day in the office. I know for many people, it's a lot more than that. So let me see, raise your hand. <laughs> raise your hand if you're actually spending, if you actually spend more than eight hours in the office. Anyone? I see a few hands, only a few hands. <laughs> How many of you actually do more than eight hours work? <laughs> okay. So, when you think about the time that you are spending at work, um, if it is not a, a joyful, fulfilling time, it's actually one third of your life that is wasted. So if you're in a workplace that is full of stress, you know, there's also good stress and bad stress. There's stress because you're rushing to do something and you're giving your best and you're just really busy. By the end of the day, you have a sense of achievement. That kind of stress is all right. But if you have the kind of stress that comes from feeling frustrated, resentful, angry, then it's going to be, uh, it's going to take a, its toll on you. And when you go home, chances are you're going to be bringing back that kind of stress to your home as well. So what we believe is that if we can turn workplaces into joy places, then people are going to go home bringing more positive energy back home to their families and they'll have more to give to their families, and that's where life really happens. So that's why uh, we do this cultural work, and that's why we're very happy to see that more and more companies are starting to get on board with this. Of course, all this was before COVID-19. So now uh, that we are in COVID-19, we know that people are experiencing <clears throat> a, lot of, a lot of chaos. Um, hang on, just let me... Okay, we know that people are experiencing a, a lot of chaos right now and things have all gone upside down for us. What started out as, okay, MCO for two weeks, two weeks, okay lah, boleh tahan lah, it's just a temporary inconvenience, we can do this, it's only two weeks. Um, but two weeks became four weeks, in Malaysia anyway, um, two weeks became four weeks and now it's six weeks and I don't know when it will end. So there are a lot of um, people who are experiencing different, uh, entire spectrum of emotions. Some may be happy, some may be relieved, some may be bored out of their minds. I heard Bharat, you were saying that earlier, you're just bored. Some people may be working harder than ever before. Some people may be struggling. Different people are experiencing different things. There's a whole range of emotions um, and experiences that people are going through. Some are coping better than others. And what I would like to do in today's session is to share with you what exactly is going on so that you will have a better understanding of how you can support your team. Okay. When we talk about uh, culture, and culture is defined as how people interact with each other, how people make decisions, how people solve problems. So you talk about in times of crisis when we're all stuck at home, it's not really a nice to have. Um, I know a lot of business leaders are actually directing their thoughts towards what are the strategies that we can implement? What is the business recovery plan? How can we cut costs? How can we pivot our business? Where can we get new revenue streams? But you think about it, whatever strategies that you have, how is it going to be implemented? It is your culture that will implement it. So culture will determine how well your people actually execute the plans. Um, sometimes the most brilliant plans will fail if it is not executed well. So are they executing it well? Are they adjusting? Are they agile enough? Can they pivot? Culture will determine that. When they're brainstorming for, for problems, nowadays for many industries, the situation looks uh, like it's impossible. We can't even see the light at the end of the tunnel. While looking at how can we cut costs. So are your people urgent, urgently and passionately brainstorming or are they kind of like 
expecting someone else to come up with the answers? Are they trying to solve their own problems? Or are they just being a victim of it? Like, oh, okay, I can't do this because uh, I, got no, I got no data plan or my Wi-Fi is not good, um, so I can't do this, or I'm stuck. And are they just being a victim of circumstances? Or are they actually trying to rise above and, and be a better person, bring up their best self in order for their families and their own companies, their teams to move forward? Your culture would determine that. Do people make hard decisions with courage or do they take the easy way out? When it comes to cost savings, is there a high level of ownership and accountability or are people just looking at the, the leaders and blaming them? Um, are people ready to spring back into action or are people going to be couch potatoes by the end of this? So this is a second sheet in your workbook. I'd like you to just take a moment and score how would you score your team on each of these areas? So I've given you a scale of one to 10. Um, 10 would be they're awesome. One is they are really uh, dysfunctional. So where would you put them? And the box at the side is just for you to capture a little, a few comments. You're right, Judy, this is an unprecedented situation and culture is really being challenged. So for those companies that have started working on their culture a few years ago, now is, where, now is the ultimate test for you to see all that effort that you have put into your vision, your values, um, all the policies and practices that you've been doing. Now you get to see, is it strong enough to hold the company up? Or are there certain areas that you need to boost? Okay. Now, I'd like, you, I'd like to share with you the crisis reflects. This is what happens when we are all faced with crisis. I'm sure you all have heard of the fight or flight situation. It's actually fight, flight, or freeze. And how it happens is that it's how our brain is developed. The reptilian brain is the earliest brain and that is responsible for our very basic instincts of eating, um, elimination and so on. The limbic brain is our second, second developed brain and that's the emotion and feeling brain. So the limbic brain has got a part of it, the amygdala, which is responsible for fight or flight. It was when, when we are faced with threat, whether real or perceived threat, it will send a message to the other part of the brain to secrete adrenaline so that our muscles are strong and ready to either run or to fight. Now, when the limbic brain is activated, what happens is that <clears throat> if we go into fight mode, we'll be very aggressive when it comes to cost cutting, we'll be very ruthless when it comes to negotiations. If we have the flight instinct that is activated, You'll see this, la, people will be in denial. Uh, no, la, it's okay, la, it's not so bad. Well, let me still go. Uh, let's have Ramadan Bazaar. Uh, let's all go on family outing. So people are going to be in denial or they will just escape. They will zone out watching endless Netflix movie binges or they will just focus on other things or sink into a state of boredom. Uh, running away from it, essentially. The other group is the people who are frozen, paralyzed, waiting, hoping that someone will come and tell them what to do, waiting for instructions, um, just stuck, hoping, wishing and hoping. But things won't get better with just wishing and hoping. So what we need to do is to not activate our limbic brain. It's actually to shift the focus, shift the energy, to the neocortex. The neocortex is a more recently developed part of the brain. It is responsible for reason, rational, logical thinking. That's where um, reason would come from. So limbic brain is responsible for a very quick reflex. And if you can, if you can halt that reflex, you can then activate your neocortex so that you can make a more thoughtful um, decision. You'll know, become decision making, creative problem solving, and you would be leading from your personal core values rather than just a uh, reflex. 
So how do you activate your neocortex? One of the ways is learn. So a good way to get out of this whole reflex is to actually get yourself to be engaged or involved in learning something new. When you're learning something new, you're going to be activating that rational part of your brain. And actually, the fact that all of you are here with me this morning, open to learn something new, tells me that you're already on the right track. Uh, I do, we do have a few more ways that you can activate your neocortex, and I'll keep that as a bonus to share with you at the very end of this talk. Don't want to get caught into that because it's a little bit off topic. Okay, so how we can have a better understanding of what's going on is, let's take a look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Are you all familiar with this theory? If you are, just raise your hand. Anyone heard of this before? Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Yep, okay. All right, so in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, at the bottom most level are our physiological needs, the need to survive. How this translates to a company's point of view is we want to have a fair salary so that we can afford a decent standard of living. We need to have enough sleep, enough food, enough water, clean air, all the basic survival needs. The next level is the need for security. Job security. Do we feel safe at our workplace? Um, sometimes if the car park is like a bit dark and dodgy, that level, this level of needs is going to be shaken. Is there also an environment of trust or is there backstabbing? Can I come to work with my gut down? If, if there is a strong environment of trust, then people are going to feel safe. The third level would be love and belonging. Is there a strong team spirit? Do I feel like I can be friends with my colleagues? They are people that I can trust. I have their back, they have my back. Also, does my job allow me to have enough time for family and for my friends, the other relationships that are important outside of work? Next level would be self-esteem. Am I doing high quality work that can give me a sense of achievement and pride? Do I get respect and recognition for the work that I do? And then when all these needs are realized, the final one is the need for self-actualization. Am I able to fully express all of who I can be? Am I working with a sense of purpose and meaning? Am I growing? Do I have an opportunity to contribute? So <clears throat> Maslow's hierarchy of needs, how it is fulfilled in the workplace are all these things that you see here. So in good times, when we work with our clients on how to build culture, we use this as a guide. It's like a framework that can guide people to see these are all the areas in which you need to attend to people's needs. And if there's any one area that is not very strong, then you may need to pay some attention there and boost that up. But today, this is what is happening. Instead of having fair salary, decent standard of living, enough sleep, salary is uncertain, people are having sleepless nights, people are worried about health their health, their family's health. Can you imagine? I, I really feel for those people whose family members are still working in shops, in doing deliveries. And what about those whose family members are the frontliners and they are doctors and nurses and ambulance drivers and policemen? <laughs> Suddenly, you know, even the very basic survival need is in jeopardy. So, if there's that constant worry of, am I going to pull through this? Is my loved one who is in quarantine, um, is he or she actually going to be safe? There's so much worry here that can totally shake our, our bottom. And this is our foundation. If we're not even sure and secure about our own survival, it's going to be very difficult to think about doing a good job or focusing at work. The next level, security. Mm -hmm. Jobs are insecure, uh, future is uncertain. Some people may, may, if they are not getting constant communication from their leaders, they may actually be questioning what's going on. I don't know if I can really trust my colleagues, my manager, my leaders, my supervisor. Are they going to take care of me? Are we going to be chopped? Who's going to be cut? Are we going to go on retrenchment? Um, are salaries going to be cut? What's going to happen? 
Will I lose my job? Will the company go bankrupt? There's so many fears and insecurities at this level. Next. Sense of isolation, sense of separation. Um, we are far away from our, our family members. I know for, for me, yes, I can still see my, my brothers via uh, Zoom or WhatsApp chat, but it's not the same as having everyone together and having family dinner. Yes, you can do it virtually, but somehow it's still not quite the same. Uh, and that's families that are separated. But what about those family members who are together in a very cramped house? I think someone mentioned it that uh, you love being with your family, but not too much. And this, it's almost like you're stuck with them 24-7. And in a situation like this, the demands from the family members, um, children who don't understand that just because you're at home, it does not mean you're on holiday, you still have work to do. Or, or parents or grandparents who still expect you to do house chores and help them out with stuff. Um, that could be a challenge. And what could be even worse, what if there are some issues or unresolved conflicts among family members? Um, not every family grows up all hunky-dory and everything as well. But if you have some unresolved conflict and you are together in the same house, there's no escape. Things may just flare up. So this level of needs is also not taken care of right now. Next, self-esteem. Once upon a time, we knew what we were good at, we knew how to do our work, but now <laughs> we're struggling with all this technology. There's so much distance between people now. Some of us are feeling useless because we're struggling and we feel like such a dummy because why can't I understand this? And some may not have equipment, um, some of the stuff could still be in the office. And there's so much to learn. It's like uh, everything that you've learned about your business, about your work, about your area of expertise, it may now be all now and white. And you have to learn new skills. So starting from the bottom again, very humbling experience. Some people may actually be questioning, what's going on? Why are we going through all this? Why is this happening? A um, lot of questions that perhaps there are no answers, a lot of frustration, a lot of helplessness. So if you look at this, you can see that at every level, things are not well. And that's why, that's why, there's this whole range, this whole spectrum of emotions, and not all of it is positive. Um, may not be all doom and gloom. So what I'd like you to do in your next worksheet, I'll give you about two minutes or so in your next worksheet. I'd like you to just see if you can fill up these boxes. What are your people experiencing right now in terms of their physiological survival needs? What do you think they're experiencing? Is it okay? Or are there certain problems or issues? What about in terms of security and safety? Love and family, love and belonging, self-esteem, self-actualization. What do you think your teams are experiencing? And what are you yourself experiencing? So I'm going to share with you the five C's of how you can restore, rebuild, and heal your team. This is the key to getting them back into good shape so that you can then lead them to be a winning team. So this is where you will fill up your actions, yeah? But let's start looking at the first level first. With the situation of the, all that uncertainty, the first C that you need to demonstrate here is the C of care. Check in on them. Let them know that you as the manager, you as their leader, you care in a very real and genuine way. Are they safe? Is their family safe? What help do they need? And sometimes the help that they need um, could be stuff like this. If they have people who are working on the front lines, do they have protective gear? Do they have sanitizers? Um, do they have sanitization services for their house? I know this morning, just this morning, my brother texted me to say that his neighbor's daughter was taken away to be quarantined. And my immediate thought was, oh no, you better sanitize your entire house. You better sanitize, go to the garden and spray. Um, 
And that's just, you know, something that is still quite remote. But what if you actually have a family member who is working on the front lines all the time? Um, or you have a lot of food deliveries. Do your staff, do your team worry about, is my house still safe? Is it sanitized? Do I need someone to come and spray and sterilize the whole place? Uh, what about medical help? Um, do you need medication? I know uh, our, one of our clients, Tigas, Tigas Pharmacy, they do a wonderful delivery service. And they actually started this delivery service last year. I've been getting my meds delivered all the time. And now they have not stopped work. They are still actively delivering medication. So do your people need help? Maybe they don't even know how to go about ordering meds um, that can be delivered to their house. Maybe you can support them that way. Legal help. Legal help would be if they need to travel or if there are things which they need to get done, you may need to help them apply for the police permit um, or, or put together the, get a doctor's letter to say that they actually, um, it is an essential reason why they need to travel. So that kind of legal help. Or if nothing else, maybe just moral support. Maybe just moral support. Be there, be that listening ear so that if they are really worried about someone in their family or themselves or their health, just let them know that there's someone that they can talk to. You know, the early days, the first week, I was having a fever and some sore throat. And I was really quite worried because before that, I've been out meeting with clients and so on. So in the early days of the lockdown, I didn't know if I was ill, I was going to you know, have the virus or not. Um, and I went to the MOH website to do a test to see whether I actually need the test. So luckily I didn't. And then after a few days, it got better and I'm fine now. But you may have some of your team members who are starting to develop fever and sore throat. And it's scary not knowing whether it's just uh, your body adjusting to the heat and the warmth of working at home or whether there's actually, they've actually picked up the bug. So reach out for them, reach out to them and let them know that you care about their, their health, their safety. Um, check in on them. Let them know that you care. It can make all the difference. Next. If they're worried about their jobs, the next C is they need to know what is the leader's commitment. And it needs to be a very real and genuine commitment. Leaders make their people feel safe. Leaders, the leader's role in this crisis is to give people certainty. In any times, um, and I think Simon Sinek talks about it very nicely. He has this whole, his book, as well as a lot of videos on leaders eat last. And in one of the talks, he, he said that this concept of leadership came about in the early caveman days when people would look to who is the strongest one who can keep the tribe safe. And they would join up and, and click together with this leader because they wanted someone who could keep everyone safe. That's how the concept of leadership started. And today, more than ever, people are looking to their leaders to see what is the certainty that you can give me. And I think the leader's role now is your, your opportunity to step up and provide people with that kind of certainty. So people need to know um, and to get constant communication. It needs to be honest, sincere, and consistent. Uh, the worst thing is when leaders do not communicate People would just make up stories in their own mind. They would speculate, they would gossip, and that's going to cause them more worry. But when leaders communicate and tell them that, okay, guys, this is what's happening, then people can have that sense of assurance. Let them know that there is a plan. You may not be able to give them certainty about the future, but you can give them certainty that you have a plan. And it's very important that they know that because you think about it, now, these are unprecedented times. No one really knows how to go about it. There is no right way. There's no path to follow. But everyone just needs to know that, okay, the leader has a plan. I put my trust in the leader, the leader has a plan. If the plan doesn't work, never mind, change your plan. But there has to be a plan. There has to be someone with a plan. If you look at any of the action movies, uh, zombie attack or any of the action movies, the leader is always not someone who knows better, but someone who has a plan. So you need to let your people know there is a plan. And build their hope on solid evidences. 
evidences of success, evidences of certain wins. Um, and what this could be is like, let's say, for example, um, okay, for us at 95%, our business is completely shaken and turned upside down because our expertise is in running workshops, very interactive workshops and consultation sessions. We do a very intense personal growth training. I know some of you are graduates of that, Shine on Fast Track, um, Power of Me. And that's what we do best. So now all that is, is blown away. We can't do that anymore. So what future do we have? And what the evidence that I could give my team was, hey, we've sold an online coaching program to a client, HPMT. Jemmy, thank you for your confidence in us. But we've done that. So this is a new market for us. This is evidence. This is the new future. There is a future. And here's the evidence. Don't just take my word for it, but here is the evidence. It is so important to provide this kind of evidence. Even if it is small, it is giving your people something concrete that they can hold on to. The final point here is promise only what is a sure thing. Do not make promises that you cannot keep. Now is not the time to assure them and say that, don't worry guys, all of you are going to be okay. You can't promise that because you really don't know how long is this MCO going to last. And MCO, I mean, the, the virus is not the real crisis. The real crisis is the global recession that is going to come for the rest of 2020, 2021, maybe even into 2022. There's going to be a global recession of unprecedented scale. Um, so don't make promises that you cannot keep. Okay, I'm going to share a little bit more about this. Um, and there are certain leaders who have done a great job of giving their people certainty by being very open and honest. The first one, some of you may have heard this already. La. It has been making its rounds ever since MCO started. Bob Chapman, he's the CEO of a manufacturing company called Barry Way Miller. And in the crisis of <clears throat> 2007 to 2008, great economic crisis, and they lost a big part of their revenue. So he was actually faced with the very hard decision of having to retrench staff. And it was around Christmas time where he, he realized that in order to really uh, cut costs, he needed to go to his people and tell them that we have to retrench staff and let some people go. But it made him feel so uncomfortable because that was in great conflict with his own personal values. So he went back, he thought about it, and then he realized that what is really important for him, it's not head count. Yes, head count is important, but even more important is heart count, counting the hearts. And he sees his company like one big family. And if one family member was to be asked to leave, it wouldn't be the same. Um, so what, what, Bar what Bob Chapman did was that he called the team together. They had many many rounds of meetings and eventually what they the plan that they came up with and it wasn't his plan because he really did not know what else to do so he got his people together he shared very openly how he felt what the situation was and people started contributing ideas and everyone was just chipping in eventually the plan that they came up with was that everyone would take four weeks unpaid leave and that would save the company enough money for them to extend uh, how long their war chests, how long their coffers can last. And not everyone could afford to take four weeks of no pay leave. So what the team did, what all the staff did was that they would trade off with each other. Those who could afford to take more unpaid leave would take five weeks or six weeks. But those people who really needed the income, they took one week or two weeks. And that's how it all balanced out. Everyone came together, they really worked together. This is win-win at its best demonstration. And it happened because Bob Chapman focused on what is the heart count. And he was willing to be open and honest and vulnerable and invite participation from his team to find the, right, the, best, the best solution for moving forward. Another one is <clears throat> Casey Sheehan, who is the CEO of Patagonia. Uh, former CEO, I think now he's selling He's with a fishing company, very happy there. <laughs> and what Casey Sheehan did, same situation as Bob Chapman, also around the same time, 
the Great Recession of 2007-2008. Um, and he went home. He was, he was instructed by the board to cut, cut people, cut salaries, cut staff. And he went home with a very heavy heart and told his wife that this is what I need to do tomorrow. And the wife said, are you coming from love or fear? And then he realized that he was coming from fear. He was fearful of the future of the company. He was fearful of um, the directors, of what would happen, um, fearful of his reputation as CEO. And he realized that, no, that's not a positive place to come from. So he switched to love. And he thought, if I was coming from love, what would I do? And love, coming from love, being connected to his heart, he realized that he needed to be open and honest with his people and invite them, allow them to be part of the solution. So similar to what Bob Chapman did, Casey Sheehan also reached out to all his people, got everyone together and told them the situation and said, I would really love to keep everyone together. But what can we do? How can we get through this together? So after a lot of brainstorm, the solution that they came up with was, let us take on <clears throat> all the work that we outsource. Let us take it on. We'll work overtime and we'll handle all the other duties, all the other tasks that we would normally outsource so that we can save on the money that we spend hiring outside suppliers. So instead of outsourcing, we will insource, we will work overtime and get the company through. And that's what they did. Everyone just, uh, instead of stopping work at five or six o'clock, they would continue working until 10, 11 o'clock because they know that we are all in this together and we're not just doing this so that the shareholders can get richer, but we're doing this for each other to keep the family intact, to keep everyone's jobs safe. So everyone pulled together and, and then what Casey did was that he realized that there were some parents, um, they need to pick up their kids from childcare and then what do they do? They can't be home with their kids. So he created uh, like a playroom in the office so that they could help to look after each other's kids until late at night. With both these companies, Patagonia, as well as with um, Barry Way Miller, because they did not retrench people, these measures allowed them to maintain their entire staff force. So when the economy started to pick up, they were way ahead of their competitors in the terms of how fast they could get back into a full production volume. And because of that, they were able to actually come out ahead. Their competitors who had retrenched staff could not produce, could not manufacture goods as quickly as these guys could. Okay, so you may say that this is Zaman Dahulu color in the year 27, uh, 2007, 2008, it's a long time ago. But today we have a hero too, the coronavirus hero. Ladies, you will thank me for this. This good looking guy is Dan Price and he's the CEO of Gravity Payments. Looks like Brad Pitt with brown hair. Um, okay, so what Dan Price did, similar to Bob Chapman and um, Casey Sheehan, his revenue was down by about 55%. And what he did was that he got the team together, um, had a number of meetings with his key team. <laughs> yes, Isaiah, beautiful specimen of a man. A bit concerned that you should be saying that. <laughs> oh, Yogesh, please post your younger photos. <laughs> okay, um, back to Dan Price. <laughs> so, um, he had a number of meetings with his team to talk about how can we save costs at a time like this so that we can ride the storm. And um, they realized, so then people started to volunteer to take less pay. But through his series of talks, he realized that not everyone could afford to have the same pay cut. So it's not about saying, okay, let's cut 10% across the board or let's cut 20% across the board. There were some people who could afford to give up more, but there were some people who could not. So what he did was he told his staff, this is how much of my pay I am going to cut. And he invited his managers to do the same. So the leaders went up first and said, openly declared, this is how much I'm willing to cut. 
And then they gave out forms to everyone for everyone to write how much they could afford to cut. And when they got everything back, they did what they saw was that the people who were higher paid were the ones who were willing to actually take more of a pay cut. Um, I wish you all the best, Dan Price. I wish your team at Gravity Payments all the best. Look forward to hearing much more, many, many more inspiring stories from you and your team in the months to come. We need to know that there are heroes today that are doing these kind of things. So the inspiring leader speech is something that not only the CEO, MDs need to master, but even CFOs, all department heads, team managers, team leaders, you need to have this kind of talk to your, to your people once a week, once a fortnight, at least minimally once a month. They need to hear from you so that they can have that sense of security. Okay, I've been talking a lot now. I'd like you to see um, based on whatever that I've shared so far, what are some actions that you can take? So in terms of looking after your people's physiological needs, is there anything that you'd like to do? And also on their safety needs, is there anything that you'd like to do? So the next area to heal the need for love and belonging is to create connections. Connections are something that you do not need physical touch or you do not need face-to-face, -face, but it is a heart-to-heart -heart connection. And connection can be experienced even virtually. It's just if you are connected to your heart and you're open and reaching out, that's when you would form a connection with people. Now, to go deeper into this, you need to understand, and, be, and this, may be, this may be difficult for some people. Okay, so how deep is the pain? Um, if it's just missing love, laughter, silliness, uh, organized activities, do Zoom workouts, uh, Zoom sharing, if it's missing the closeness, sometimes Zoom, you can still have your, your deep conversations. Don't just use Zoom as a means of transacting something, um, but it can also be a, a place for you to share. Um, it's just how deep you take that conversation and if you are taking that conversation to a deeper level that's when people feel that okay you're really here for me you're really listening and listen with your heart that's when you can still have that closeness but if you go even deeper it could be that there are unresolved issues and if there are unresolved issues once upon a time it was easy to avoid you could just get out of the house but now you need to face up to it and how do you face up to it is start healing these issues. Um, what I do, I always look at myself first. What is my, my own inner truth? I can imagine um, if I have two brothers, if one of them were to be living with me right now, I think I would be climbing the walls. Uh, my brother, love him dearly, but he has this habit of always wanting to have the last word. Everything that I share, he will know better and he will have a better story. Um, so he's always like the smartest person in the room. Nah. Um, <laughs> I may be talking to him about my pain at the dentist and he will tell me he knows all about it, but his pain is more and worse and his dentist is better. So he's like that kind of a know-it-all. So if how I come to terms with him and still love him as a brother is that I look at what is my own inner truth. Instead of being a victim of him, I look at how, how am I responsible for my own feelings? Um, and, and I see that whenever my brother talks about that, it's actually triggering my own feelings of insecurity. I'm the youngest in the family, and when I was growing up, I somehow picked up the belief that, oh, because I'm the youngest, I'm not as smart as my older brothers. And because uh, I'm more into the arts part of things, I'm more creative rather than academic, I'm stupid, not as intelligent as them. So these issues are being triggered every time my brother does his know-it-all things. So when I realize that, then I realize that, okay, it's actually about me, not about him. I can't control him, but I can control how I feel about it. So if I were to look at my own inner truth and realize that 
it is actually triggering these beliefs and, and programs that I picked up when I was young and didn't know better. So I am then able to shift to a place where I'm no longer blaming him, but I've taken responsibility for my own experience, for my own interpretation of how he is. He will still be how he is, and I think he's fine. Um, he still has family members who love him, <laughs> people who hang out with him. He still has his friends who like him, so he must be okay. So it's not him, it's me. And that's how I look at it. Now, this is not a very deep or serious issue. If it is a much deeper issue than that, then maybe this is also the time to reach out, reach out to a coach if you want to get yourself out of it and see things from a different perspective. There are many coaches who offer their services now at, at um, very greatly discounted rates. Or if it's even a deeper issue, look for counselling. I mean, I, mean, I just heard that um, MOH has a, a, a group of psychologists are offering uh, counselling sessions at only 50 ringgit per session. So there is help and there is no shame in reaching out. We are in crisis situations, so there's really no shame in reaching out. Uh, even deeper, there may even be abuse. Abuse is not only physical, but it could even be mental or emotional abuse. So that's where you really need to reach out and ask for help. Um, I saw this on Facebook recently. Someone posted this. He's actually my business mentor. So I was quite surprised to see him posting this. He says, if you're stuck in quarantine with a toxic or abusive partner, message me about my free meal delivery service. I don't have one, but I know that you need help. If you place an order and include your address, then it's a sign, it's like secret code, I will contact the police. So reach out and have people that um, can be your lifeline in times like this. And you may want to offer and be someone else's lifeline in a time like this. This is not, I don't have a quick and easy answer for you in terms of how to connect and restore the love and belonging. I can only point you to the path which is heal whatever that is unresolved. Um, and how to heal different people find different ways. Some find a lot of comfort and solace in religion or spiritual practices. And if that works for you, then go for that. Some may need some um, help from coaches or counsellors or, or even just friends who can listen and go for that. This is a whole different topic altogether. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Next. Next level. Confidence and self-esteem. How do we tag dummies, uh, grapple with it? I mean, what leaders need to do is to give their teams clarity. When you give, what I mean by giving your teams clarity is that, okay, here's a, quite an incredible story <clears throat> about Southwest Airlines. So, they were very badly hit. This was a long time ago. They only had four planes and they were very badly hit and they had to Is sell Jenna, one. Jenna, I you. think so. I think I lost her again. Sorry guys, just give her a few more minutes. She'll be back. Oh, she's back. Janet, are you back? Can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you all hear me? Okay, yes, we can. Good to go. Okay, so um, where, where did you guys miss out? You missed the clarity part? Okay, thanks Isaiah, thanks for the prompt. Okay, let me just go back to the screen before. How, we, how leaders need to restore people's um, confidence and self-esteem is to provide them with crystal clarity. There are some people who are thinkers and strategists, but there are a whole lot of people who are great at operating and executing. Don't ask them to think, but if you tell them what to do, they can execute that very well. And the kind of clarity, um, a brilliant example of that kind of crystal clarity that can align everyone and get them to spring into action is a story about, hang on, uh, about Southwest Airlines. So when they started, I think about a year or two after they started operating, they had four planes. And because of, they were not doing well, they had to sell one. So they were left with only three planes. But the CEO said, we cannot afford to have fewer flights. 
So obviously, right, you sell one plane, there'll be fewer flights. We think we cannot afford that. Um, every time the planes are not in the air, we are losing money. We need to pay airport tax and we don't get the revenue from airfares. So the industry norm at that time was it would take a plane at least 60 minutes or one hour to turn around before it can fly again. So that one hour is when passengers would collect their luggage, disembark, um, the cabin crew would clean up, the new cabin crew would come in, make sure that everything is spick and span, and then they let the new passengers board and the plane takes off again. But because it was hard times, the CEO said, 10 minutes, we have to do the turnaround in 10 minutes. If not, we're going we're gonna to go bankrupt. People are going to lose their jobs. So can you imagine if your CEO gave you that kind of an instruction? Something that usually takes one hour, we have to shorten it to 10 minutes. You crazy or what? But they felt that, you see the quote at the bottom there in red, they felt that they were fighting for their jobs. And everyone had to pull together to do this. 10 minutes, we have to focus. 10 minutes, 10 minutes. That became the rally cry. There was no doubt about it. There's no, oh, let's reduce our 60 minutes a bit. How much is a bit? Reduce it to 45 minutes. Would that work? Reduce it to 30 minutes. That is ambiguous. 10 minutes, crystal clear. Everyone knew that was what they needed to go for. So how they made it work was everyone just jumped in to, to help each other out. Um, whenever when people disembarked, the flight engineer was looking out the window and he realized that the way the baggage was coming out could be better operated, could be better managed. So he went down and he helped the baggage handlers remove bags. He's the engineer, a very high position, but he went down and he helped carry bags and he helped organize that so that it was faster. The air stewardesses um, who were cleaning up the cabin, the pilot and co-pilot came out and helped them pick up tissue and rubbish and so on. Everyone just pulled together and they did things that were not even within their job scope because they had clarity. We have to turn this plane around in 10 minutes. And they succeeded. They actually succeeded because everyone had that clarity. So what you need to do in your team is to give them that kind of clarity. We have to get this done in 10 minutes, guys, or whatever it is, okay? So when you're assigning your tasks and delegating, this is what I call empowering delegation. Break the task down into bite-sized pieces. Not everyone can think and strategize. So now is not the time to give people a very broad task and say, okay, go and think about it and figure out how to do. Cannot. Um, you need to understand that people's needs at the bottom levels are all shaken. So when all that is shaken, emotions are high. And when emotions are high, intelligence is low. So what you need to do, don't, don't require people to think so much. Just tell them what you need them to execute. Break it down into small bite-sized pieces. And then make sure that they actually understand what you have told them. Check that they understand. Uh, if there's a misalignment of understanding, I think I have told you A, but you understand B, both sides are going to be very disappointed with the results. You also need to check that they know how to do it. So like, for example, I want you to do A. Yes, I understand you want me to do A, okay? How do you plan to do it? And then that person will be, um, okay, I think I need to do this, then I need to call this, then I need to check that, then I need to put this. Okay, great. Check that they know how to do it. If they don't know, then you need to really go step by step by step. And then set short milestones. Don't give them one week, give them one day or two days. Check in on them frequently. Break it down to really small, 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 small steps so that they can experience themselves winning step by step and celebrate all the small wins. That's how you can give people clarity um, at a very micro level. Because the bigger level is, what is that rallying cry for everyone? Okay, can I move on? So now, uh, I'll give you a bit of time for you to, again, pin down. Are there any thoughts that are coming up for the next two levels? The level of love and belonging and self-esteem. So, at the highest level, the need for self-actualization. If people are feeling frustrated, 
uh, helpless and lost, what can we do? This is the fifth C. And this C is give them a compass. Where are we headed? What is true north for us? So how you do that? What is your company's vision? How does that vision come to life now? This is what would unify your people. Call back the vision. If you need to, break it down to a smaller vision. For 95%, our vision is turning workplaces into joy places. Now, if I talk about that now, it's laughable. Who has a joy place? <laughs> Companies are either worried about their future or they are so busy producing masks and ventilators. Who has a joy place? It's laughable. But we break it down. We know, and I keep reminding my team that our vision, our true north is we need to do everything that we can to help our clients recover. We need to help our clients build back their businesses because our clients are looking after not only themselves, but all the people in their team, all the people in their employ. Now, always remember, um, this is something that one of our clients, Cindy from Boat Noodle, this is what she said to her team when we were running the cascade for them. And she told them they have about uh, 500 workers from Bangladesh in the various restaurants serving. Um, and, and she spoke to them and she said that the moment I sign your employment letter, I am responsible for you. I am answerable to your family. So can you imagine that kind of ownership from a leader? Isn't that amazing? And that's what leaders, that's the leader's role. So I always remind our team that we need to help our clients. We need to do everything possible. We need to learn. We need to focus so that we can do our best to help our clients recover and once again, build back that workplace where people can thrive. We want to help them look after their people. So now, for you, for all of you, it's an opportunity for you to think, what is the company's vision? And how can you share that with your people? How can you break that down into a why that they can relate to? Show them the connection. Make the links for them. They need to know what is the why. Why do I still need to work? Uh, my friends are just cooking and, and making Dalgona coffee, you know. Why do I need to work? Allah, today I think I got a headache. It's very hot and uncomfortable in my room. Why do I need to work? Give them that compass. Then they will have that sense of purpose. Don't assume that they can make the links themselves. They are not you. They do not have your years of experience. They do not have the big picture view that the leaders would have. They're seeing it from their small view. So if you don't give them a vision, they're going to be like this. The, the story of the blind man, you know, trying to feel an elephant. If they're, only, if they're not seeing the big picture, they only see their small part, they, won't, they will not know what's going on. So the leader's role in a time like this is to keep people engaged. What is the big picture? so that they're able to see beyond their limited perception of, oh man, this sucks. They can see, why are we doing this? So give them that big picture view. Okay, now we come to this sheet in your worksheet. So if you would just call this out, you're probably wondering what this diagram is about. Um, so this, for this one, this is the compass for your company, your team. Okay, right in the middle, I'd like you to write your company's vision. So put down the exact words as best as you can remember. What is the company's vision? Put it in that circle there. Next, on the top part of that curve, what is the mission? And next would be, what is the specific rally cry for this time? In this time of crisis, is there a rally cry? What is it? And then in the orange boxes would be your company's core values. So see if you can recall. If you cannot, go to your company's website and Google it. But hopefully you can recall what the values are. Um, if you don't have six, that's okay. Just fill up as many boxes as you need. Okay. 
I'm going, I'm, let me brief you first and then I'll give you some time to do this. After you have filled all this up, I'd like you to use all the white space and start creating your mind map for each of the values. What would be certain things that you can do to make the values come alive? How can you activate these values? So like for example, um, in this crazy time, if you have a value of, of uh, joy, for example, I'm just choosing joy because it's something that not many people are experiencing right now. But if you have a value of joy, then what you may want to do is, how can I bring even a little bit of joy to my team members? Maybe what I can do is I can order food and send to them, surprise them with a slice of cheesecake or balloons and flowers or something like that. So from this way, I'm going to give you guys about two, three minutes uh, to, to just create a mind map and let's see what you can come up with. How can you activate all your core values? This whole thing is what we call the culture manifesto. Let's see how you can activate it, okay? So from here, you would have come up with uh, maybe certain things that you want to do. Um, and the purpose of giving you these worksheets is so that you have a place to download whatever ideas that come up for you. But the next step really is to try to crystallize. And I think what would be a win is if you were to leave this webinar with just five things, one for each of those, those areas, or if um, you find that certain area may need, certain areas are okay, but other areas may need more things, that's fine too. But I would, I think what would be productive is instead of coming up with a long list of everything, just focus on what would be a few things. Um, yes, seeing rally cry means, yes, specifically during this MCO, what would be a rally cry that can help your company go beyond just for this time? Um, but how long is this time? We also don't know. <laughs> Maybe look at it as for the next three months. We don't know when MCO is going to be lifted, but even after it is lifted, life will not go back to normal so quickly. So what would be a rally cry that you can come up with that at least can last your people throughout Ramadan um, into June and maybe July? That would be the very critical recovery time. Yes, Barak, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. It could be sales, it could be morale, it could be cost cutting. As the business leader, you would know what is most relevant, what is most important for your team. Okay, so to wrap up, let's see if you guys remember what would be the first C to handle people's physiological needs. What would be the first C? Type it in. Oh, type it in. Okay, awesome. Good job. Next, for safety, what would be the next C? Very fast, Janice, SP, love it, love it. Good job, guys, good job. Commitment. And then for the next one, love and belonging. Yes. You guys are fast, you must be gamers. Uh, younger generation, very fast with that. Okay, and for self-esteem, how can you build your team's self-esteem? Get them to start winning, that's right. Give them clarity. And then finally, how can you give them direction? That's right, compass. So these are the five C's that you need to put into place to help your team restore all the pyramid of needs, the hierarchy of needs. This will help you to restore, rebuild, and heal your team. Once you have this, that's when you can start um, getting that strong team together. And this strong team can help you overcome anything. I, I think of it as this way. It's like an um, analogy that I use is, um, in this time, you're in troubled waters. You're in stormy seas. Your team can either get you to sink, swim, or surf. A team that makes you sink is when people are lost and they're weighing you down like a heavy stone. But if you get your team together, you can get them to work hard. They'll be like swimmers. But swimmers, when there's no sight of land, they're going to get tired. But if you can get them together, tight, strong, aligned, they'll be like a surfboard. 
and that will help you and your company surf through the stormy waters. That's what we hope to be able to do. Okay, the last nugget, how do you strengthen your neocortex? And this is a way to quieten down your amygdala or your limbic brain so that you're not caught up in all the negativity, um, you're not caught up in the flight, fight and freeze. These are exercises that you can do. The, the great thing about your brain is that it can be developed, it is ever-changing. Um, if you use it more, more neural pathways will be formed. If you neglect it, then those pathways will just die off. So you can consciously develop the neocortex, which is the part for rational thinking, for calm, clear decision making. And I've divided this into body, mind and heart. So what you can do at a very physical level, sorry, at the mental level, learn something new. When you're learning something new, you're engaging the part of your mind that is responsible for reasoning. So if there's nothing new to learn, you're going to be focused on the limbic brain, the flight, the uh, fight or freeze, getting bored, getting stuck. So engage your, yourself in learning something. And this is also something that you can do with your people. Yeah? Now is the best time to get them to learn something new. Next thing is create silly jokes, riddles, puns, memes, lame jokes. That triggers your brain. When you're making connections with your brain, it keeps it alive and active. Go beyond your comfort zone. Every time you do something that is out of the ordinary, something that is out of the familiar, you're again forcing your brain to form new pathways. Um, you're also building up courage as a muscle. It will get stronger with more practice. Practice positivity. Stay away from the negativity. It is too easy to get sucked into this, this whole um, everything sucks, everything is lousy, everything is rotten, poor me. There's no point being there. The more you stay there, the more you are strengthening your limbic brain. You don't want to do that. You want to quieten down the limbic brain by activating the neocortex. Meditate. When you meditate, you're actually bringing awareness to your breath to slow down. When your breathing slows, you're slowing down the limbic brain, quieting it, telling it, go to sleep, get some rest. And that's when your neocortex can be stronger. Doesn't matter what kind of meditation, um, most of them activate the prefrontal cortex, which is part of your neocortex. And then for your body, eat clean, uh, stay away from too much sugar, too much salt, too much fried oily stuff. Priscilla, hear me? Not too many, not too much fried crispy stuff at this time. Um, eat clean and move. So I know there are many of you who are like restless and stuck. Your body is dying to move, but you can't. Do jumping jacks, do burpees, do push-ups, dance, <laughs> whatever it is. Chase your cat around, <laughs> whatever it is. Just get moving. When you're moving, your body, your energy will flow. And you know, it's, it's, I find it, it's so much more tiring to do a Zoom webinar like this than an actual training because here I'm sitting down, the body doesn't move very much. In an actual training, I'm walking around and so on. It's a lot less tiring. So let your body move. And sleep. You need to get enough sleep. Uh, don't get stuck on Facebook or social media. Don't Netflix binge too much. You need to make sure that you get enough sleep. And then finally, volunteer. Do some good, do some charity work. Even if it's a little bit of a donation or even if it's just like helping your neighbor or checking in on people. Um, volunteering activates your heart, which is the prefrontal cortex. Uh, give someone a hug. If you're all alone, adopt a stray kitten and hug your kitten. I, I recharge best when I'm with my cats. Um, my husband will only tolerate me for so long and then he will throw my cats at me. <laughs> so then that's how I recharge. Um, don't underestimate the power of a hug. That physical contact with someone who is in a loving space can do a lot to de deactivate 
the lizard brain, the limbic brain, and assure you that all is well. Focus on your neocortex. Yes, Ian, hug is important. Okay, what's next? We've come to the end of uh, today's talk. So what's next is, if there are those of you who want to take this further, and um, today what I've done is I've shared with you the framework. I've done my best to share with you from my experience what I know in how to build a strong team. But what I'm not able to do in today's session is to guide you through the implementation. And for that, we have this program called Leading Through Crisis. Um, I selected this picture simply because, simply because. Um, but what, what this program is, it's how do you apply the five C's in a conscious manner so that you can lead your team through this crisis to come out stronger and richer than ever before. If you look at leaders today, here are some of the leaders who are actually doing a great job leading their countries out of crisis. The amazing thing is that they all have something in common. They're all female. So we have actually been studying and following um, and understanding what these people are doing um, and how, how leaders from everywhere, different industries um, can learn from this and apply it in their own way. No, I'm not saying that everyone should start becoming, uh, wearing a, having long hair or wearing a skirt, but it is just that the women are a lot more in touch with empathy, with compassion. And again, it is the prefrontal lobe, um, the prefrontal cortex that is operating, and they're making decisions coming from clarity and values rather than from that aggression, the aggressive fight or flight. So in this Leading Through Crisis program that we have coming up, what we will be covering will be a series of online trainings and coaching sessions on how do you apply the five C's that we've spoken about today and how do you lead yourself. Leading, with, leading through crisis starts with leading yourself. Next would be leading your team. Next would be leading your clients. So it's all about how do you lead through this murky storm. Outcomes that you can expect would be leaders would learn how to run powerful virtual town halls so that they can continuously engage their people. Um, how to put together and craft the inspiring leader speech. We will be guiding you through that. Um, how do you have strengthened client relationships? This time of crisis is the best time to let your clients know that you're not just a vendor, you're a partner. You're an ally. You're someone that they can rely on. And then finally, how do you create an aligned winning team? So this is the program that we have coming up. Uh, we're looking to launch this maybe just around, hopefully just before Raya. If you think this would be something that is interesting for you or your team of leaders, what I'd like you to do is to just comment, lead, type in the word lead in the chat box so that the team will know to follow up with you. Let me just see. Okay. I think that's all that we have time for today. I've already overrun. Um, thank you so much for, thank you so much for being with me, spending your morning with me. I really hope you have picked up something useful. The fact that you're here, it's already very heartening. You wouldn't be here if you didn't care about your team. So I really thank you for having that compassion and empathy and care in your heart. And I really hope that you can apply these five C's to create a better experience for your team and lead them through this crisis.